So a big warm welcome uh, to everyone today. Um, and um, first of all, uh, before we kick things off, um, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the lands on which we stand, which if we're standing at QUT are the Turrbal and the Yogara people. Uh, I'd like to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, peoples play within our community, within communities uh, Australia-wide. And um, yeah, so look, today, uh, very excited to be um, hearing from Siren Rimkem. Siren has been doing some really, I think, fascinating work but work also that I think is really very much needed in data science, because as many of us know, data science tends to be an area where there's often a very strong focus on methods and technologies and algorithms, but maybe not the mm. matching focus on the human beings whose lives are affected by those technologies, methods and algorithms, or whose data may mm -hmm. find their way into um, uh, those kinds of analytical approaches. So Siren, look, um, I, I'm really keen to uh, hear about the work that you've been doing um, with uh, older adults and some of the, the data that you've been making sense from. As we said before the webinar started, I will be keeping an eye on the um, questions and answers. So a very warm welcome to the audience to uh, please share your questions. And Siren, like we agreed before, if somebody's asking something which, which might be absolutely critical at that moment, are you okay if I interrupt you and say, Siren, we, we've yes. got a good question? Yes, definitely. I'm happy to do that. All right. Okay. Right. Well, please um, uh, share with us uh, some of the great work that you've been doing, Sarah, and I'm really keen to know. Um, thanks, David, for a good introduction about the data science perspective and the work that we have been doing for um, exploring uh, how older adults make sense of our well-being data. Um, uh, it's delighted to be here to present our work for a CDS audience or general audience who, who joining in for, for the webinar. Again, my name is Sirin Rum Kam and I'm working with Dr. Aloha Amber with this project about exploring how other adult makes sense of well-being data. And also, uh, we, need, we would like to thank for the support for CDS as well to providing uh, an opportunity to, to, uh, to start the, the, the project right here uh, for the, the first bike grant for the funding as well. Um, um, I think I need to click there. So, um, as David already mentioned, we um, acknowledge the traditional owner where the QVT stand and we pay respect to an older uh, um, elder law custom creation spirit. And we recognize this land away being a place for uh, teaching, research and learning. And QVT is acknowledged the important role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people play within the QVT communities. Um, um, with the work that we, we have been doing so far, um, is there, um, there is still progressing and we, we were able to submit our work to the um, uh, ACM CHI conference 2023. So it's under progressing at the moment, but we, we, we would love to share some sort of the, the idea and some sort of a big picture view of what we have done um, uh, with this work. Um, so let let move on what 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 I will discuss for today. So I will talk a little bit about what is do we mean by well being, and are there any sort of potential measurement that we can really like understand or measure our well being perspective, any variable technology that would be really helpful for us to understand our own well being and also other people well being as well and really why well-being is really important for us. 
And then we conclude with their and opportunities and challenges that we have been facing throughout the study. And we hope that at the end, um, some of the audience might find out a useful kind of recommendation or feedback if uh, you were interested in their um, exploring their um, the technology for an older adults. All right, so before we begin with their, um, uh, the whole study that we want to uh, explain, I would like to just like clarify what do we really mean by well-being. So well-being is a really like complex scenario as um, you can see on this screen. So well-being is uh, a three concept that interrelated or correlated together. So this one is just the biopsychosocial model of health. And you can see well-being is a sit, um, an overlap of social, biological, and psychological um, um, area. With the biological data, uh, we emphasize on personal health and well-being um, in terms of like a measurement that we can use to measure like a wearable technology, other kind of sensor that we can measure, and then we get a concrete number at the end. Also, we have other aspects of well-being as well. So we have psychological uh, perspective, uh, our um, attitude, our character, our belief, our self-esteem, and our emotion, our feeling as well. So that embedded in our well-beings. Apart from personal perspective, we also have a social context that we really like make sense of the, the well-beings our educational background, our peer, friends, and uh, family, socioeconomic backgrounds. So really well-being is a really complex um, um, term that is maybe quite hard to measure using um, one of the dimension of the measurement alone. Um, so we are really like uh, dig down into the, the well-being in terms of uh, three um, area or three perspectives. And, and now we kind of understand what, what is the well-being is it about. So what really like out there in the market that we could potentially use for measure, track, or monitor well-being in some extent. So looking from the past to the present and me moving forward to the futures. During the past, we have um, 1770, so the first pedometer was announced. And then it just introduced about the fitness tracking that they used the, the movement sensor to track the movement or the steps. So there, because of the advancement of the technology with the chip becoming smaller and smaller, there's uh, an introduction of the, uh, the first power oximetry that they can measure the oxygen level in 1935. And then it keeps just moving forward until we see some of the advanced technology about the fitness tracking, like a Fitbit as well. So it was introduced in 2009. But this day, we also like see many of the uh, smart variables out there in the markets. Some of the ex obvious example that we already see is smart watches like an Apple watches. Maybe some of the audience may have one. I already had one of smart watches as well. So this is a quite uh, interesting um, area to explore because there's sort of meta, many dimension that we can get from the smart device itself. For example, with the Apple Watch, you can um, get the heart rate, you can get the fitness level, and then you can potentially get the blood oxygen level as well. So those kind of data is quite really useful for us just to look into what really we can make sense of it, what is really we can take that on board and see how we could improve our life at the end. So I was talking about this because it's really useful to get um, you all um, a very like a broad background in terms of what is already out there in the market. Um, um, with the wearable technologies, again, 
um, it keep advancing and progressing really fast in this area. So I would like just to um, to to make a picture. What do we mean by variable device in this angle? So um, this is just the model or the framework from the um, from Chipkin and his team that he classified the different type of devices based on the IEC International uh, Electrotechnical Committee. So with their smart variable device on the left hand side, their figure A. So smart device can be classified into four. Um, components. So one that they call near body electronics. So that is the device that does not contact the external surface of the organism directly. Uh, an example might be smart watches, so some other accessories. The second one is on body electronics. So the device contact um, external interface with organism directly. So that through textile, fabric, and stuff like that. And also the third one is about in-body electronic that the device or sensing device located internal of organism, um, for instance, patchable or uh, potentially smart tattoo. And the last one is about electronics tactile that, uh, that it made up of fabric, textile that uh, within that component and um, implement in, in, in that area. So in the figure B is just the, the, the progress of variable device or the variable technology that has been developing um, um, for a while. The first one is quite obvious to add is the first generation or accessory like smartwatches, smartphone, then it moving forward for a second generation, smart tactile that you can potentially put the sensor on the cloth and then measuring your, your blood oxygen level or your heart rate or your movement and stuff like that. And the third generation is more or less like a, a, a sensor on your body itself. It can potentially um, monitor or measure uh, um, blood glucose level and those kind of things. And the fourth generation for generation is about implantable sensor. So the progress of the wearable technology is moving really, really fast. I think uh, it's really good to understand the whole concept of this bird. What would what 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 is the level of wearable technology is out there in the market? Um, here is some obvious example as I previously mentioned that uh, the first generation of the wearable device is commonly out there in the markets. The one that available is smart glasses, uh, smartphones, smart shoes, and um, smart ring as well. Um, the, the future development is still like in progress as well. There some of the uh, example of implantable wearable is the uh, smart tattoo that really in progressing at the moment. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for, for, for device that we can use to uh, get out of the um, biological data or physiological data from the user for, for the, uh, the person perspective. So we know that well-being is really about a complex scenario between social, biological, and physiological perspective. And we know that oh, there's a lot of variable out there that we can take on board to use uh, to use to understand the well-beings. But in particular, with this context, we really want to focus on the well-being for aging populations. So within these aging populations, the reason that we would like to emphasize in this area is that because um, there's not many progression in terms of the understanding of older adults on how they make sense of their personal data or how well-being is related to them. And again, this one is also emphasized by the WHO is the, the decade of healthy aging as well. As we all getting 
I mean, getting older or aging. So we want to find out what else that we could support their, the, the, our friend, our, our family or ourselves in the future as well. What really the best technology or uh, what assistance that they really need. And in Australia, with their uh, Department of Health, they are also promoting the healthy aging and to live in a happy life as well. So we have the technology on one, one side and we have the, we need to understand the well-being and we hope that aging well with technology can take on board in, in terms of like um, uh, at the end of the, the study. And again, we all know that everybody is different, but we want to really like to understand like a, like a common ground, a common understanding of, of how older adults live their life. Some of them might be like, can do things by themselves. Some of them might be really like struggling um, and need to find some sort of people to help them. And we, we are really like keen on exploring that area more as well, how the technology or how their, the data science perspective can really help them to improve their own understanding. And potentially they can have their own awareness and they can um, support them to, themselves. As the well-being is really complex scenario, when we, we talk about individual or one persons, it's about us, it's about their, uh, our perspective, uh, their, the genetic, the behavior, and also with, within ourselves, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, someday we feel sad because uh, we don't, um, we have done a lot of work or uh, some stuff like that. Someday we feel really good. It involves so many facets of, their, uh, of, of our human beings. And again, environment that uh, people live in as well. Most of their, um, or, I mean, most of us live in, in at home. Some of the people, I mean, older adults live alone at house and some of them really need some sort of the assistive technology to help them to potentially order some food or um, to connect with their, their peer with the social interactions. So in this study, we really want to find out what those things are really meaning to them and how could the technology and their, um, the data science perspective could come to help. And if we understand them more, we can build a better support for them at, at the end. Um, we would like to find out what is really uh, they expect for uh, their, 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 their current daily living and how they interact with um, the environment surrounding them and how this technology could be support um, them as well. And potentially they can take that on board to um, help provider and provide some sort of idea to, to give the, the add-on or the complement to, to, to the level of the, the well-being is there. And again, uh, with the smaller scale that we have conducted, so we want to find out their, uh, what is they really need and how could we improve. And potentially this could be leading to a long-term um, monitoring or long-term support for them as well. Not only for a period of time of the study, when study finished, okay, goodbye. So it's not like that. So we just want to find out what is really happening afterward as well. Um, there's a kind of uh, our aim just really to focus on their um, um, older people and how, how we make sense of that. Of course, um, with their, a lot of data um, gathering around, their, around us, like, like it or not, data is everywhere. Like in this webinar, uh, we also recording, there's a data there, right? So the data is everywhere, we can't really deny it. And we really want to find out what is their a kind of their um a theme or the system that we can really use to shape our own personal data. In our study, we we build our uh, understanding around human data interactions. So there is a kind of a conceptual framework that concerns about the design of the system where they collect and process personal data. So with the with the the framework itself is uh, bring their 
the, the control to the human or the user. So they will be able to decide whether that data they want to share, whether that data is, um, can they control the data? Can they interpret and experience the data in the meaningful ways? So we use this HDI um, conceptual framework to frame the whole study and bringing the, the person or the human in, in the call center of the, the discussion there. Um, with the HDI, so they, they class, classify into three themes. So basically they want to emphasize on the, the urgency of the, the data that the person can share. So the first thing that we call is legitimacy, which imply that making data and it processing transparent and in, uh, intelligible to those it concerns. So in HDI, it hope to, to, help, to help make things not only transparent, but legible. So people can really see, oh, that's the data, oh, that's what does it mean, and it's reliable. And moving to the second theme, so it brings forward the agency of the data. So people or human need to be in control. So people need to uh, be able to opt in to see the data, or they want to opt out that I don't want this data to be shown. So those sorts of agency or control is really critical at the moment. And also the third thing is about negotiability. So that is the mean a system design to help you, you work with those who receive the data about you and so as change how they use the data. So you would be able to like negotiate whether the data is like, oh, do you want to share it or not, those sorts of things. So we use kind of HDI to frame the whole study that bring out people urgency in at the end. Um, with that theme, we 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 also uh, uh, want to unpack and order adult um, how they understand their data and how they see their well being to their own interpretations and their own experiences and how they really interact with others. With others, we mean um, friends, families, peers, or even with the research team. So we kind of like want to find out what is really meaning for them and how could we use that to lead a new way of thinking based on the human data interactions. And at the end, we want to unpack any uh, opportunity and challenges that the consumer grade divide uh, provide this art with the well-being in order uh, adult. So this is just um, st study approach that um, we have been conducting for, for I think the past six or seven months. Um, so we really focus not only for uh, the digit, the number, the step, physical activities, we also focus on the subjective matter as well. So we combine the quantitative data from the variable device. And also we have the, um, the user have the right to say things. So we have the, um, uh, the diary, we have observation, we have an interview with data that we could then combine both quantitative and qualitative data so that we can uh, understand other people a bit more. And then at the, the final end of the product, we would like to raise an awareness what is really well-being and how could we represent the well-being to other people so that they understand and then they are kind of like in control. If they want to decide to go to see the doctor or they just want to just, oh, I feel all right, I just stay at home, those sort of thing. So it's just like that to bring the awareness to individual and also it can promote their social interaction as well. As people are in control of their own health, they can they, they have their, um, the right to share with the right persons like uh, with their partner, with their peer, or even with the research teams. That's why we, 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 we conduct the study right here. 
So those one is quite um, like a really high level of the study approach that um, uh, we have been conducting. Um, all right, so uh, let's move to the, the, the study procedure, what we have got there and how we could like derive all the data from the participants. So with the study that we are we were running, we engaged with four other couples. So that's 68 for eight participants. I was yeah, eight participants. And we have the technology home trial as well. We gave them their um the wearable device. And also uh, they, they're gonna wear the device for a period of six to eight days. And we conducted their the diary study to get their their own um, um their own daily routine, and at the end we do some sort of co-design workshop. The spelling mistake. There's co-design workshop at the end. So some of you might be wondering why why this variable technology that uh, that we were using. So there's a lot of wearable technology out there in the market, like a uh, physical activity that you can track the, the, the fitness level, you can have Apple watches to track you everything. But in our research, we, we kind of like using this um, with things smartwatch, just to, um, to for, for, for participants just to monitor their physical activity and sleep trackings. During the time that we were conducting the study there, I mean, the Apple Watch doesn't have their sleep tracking functions. So that's why we didn't use that smartwatch for, for this study. And the other important thing that we chose this um, variable device is because it's claimed to be clinical grades that um, validate against some of the uh, study, um, uh, the gold standard of sleep study and uh, provide some sort of useful feedback. And it's also of the chill product that we can take some sort of data and quickly um, uh, review the data to the participants. So that's why we are choosing this um, uh, wearable device. Um, we, we also uh, divide our study into three main uh, Base, just to understand their um, sensory data from the variable device and the human contact of using um, those device as well. So uh, with their, uh, the study that we have been conduct, we divide into three different like phase. So this one is the setting up the phase where we went with the participant home, we set up the technology, we let them wear the wearable device for six to eight days. And then we uh, provide them the diary so that they can log the detail throughout the day. After six to eight days, we're gonna came back and then we're gonna do some sort of the co-design workshop to unpack and review what is really interesting piece of information or data there. And then we wrap it up with the co-creation phase where we, uh, as a research team and also participants uh, working together to potentially see uh, what really well being can meaningful for them and what are the form of their data representation that can um, um, depict or, or understand that angle. So um, the Easter uh, kind of deep down into each step of the phase that we have been conducting. So setting up the scene, setting up the technology trial. So we, we visit the participant home. So in this case, it's a couple. So we talk to them. We, we brought some of the device for them to have a look on, on the top, I mean, top left there. So that myself, just to explain their, um, the smart mattress. So we bring the smart mattress as well. We bring the, um, the phone and smart watches. But unfortunately with the smart mattress, we have some technical issue, the Bluetooth connection and Wi-Fi connections. After figuring out for half an hour, we couldn't get it to work. So we decide that, okay, we will just forget on their smart watch that we already have. So with the smart watch, 
we can have um, the daily activities and we can also have their inactivity during the night. That means you can track sleep as well. So we explain to them how it works and show them they can see the data on their um, on the phones and show them some example of the graph there. So uh, so that they can um, see the data in real time. And also we provide some the diary uh, for them just to log the detail throughout the day as well. How did how do they feel? Whether they're happy? What make them interested in during the day? So that we can combine both their data from variable divide and the diary together. So this is the post um, trial phase. So after six to eight days, depend on participant viewing it just to wearing the device, we came back and then we we print some sort of their uh their the graph for for their for facilitating the discussions. So with this uh, study tooling and correlating, we try to unpack and identify what is really important for, for them and explore how the data play, play uh, an important role in everyday well-beings. So we co-analyze this, bring in some conversation and print out their, the graph for them to have a look. So, because we can see the data in real time, we were able to prepare the printout session for them. We as a researcher team print out the, the normal day of the data. And then we also print out the, the one, the mysterious data as well, the, the, the one that we were in doubt, the one that is, doesn't make sense to the researcher team. So we, we bring out that all the detail to the participant so that they can of uh, they can like facilitate or add on of the discussion there. So this one is just the uh, snapshot of some of the study telling and correlating idea of the data. At the end, we we sort of like using pen and pencil uh, pause it just to to share the the understanding with the participants that. Um, myself and other research team also discussing what is really like happening during that day of the, the raining day that that the data, I mean, not the data, the, the variable telling us that the participants were cycling during the raining day. And we were really confused who can do that in the raining day. So we bring that to the participant and we were like, uh, discussing about that day, the participant looked back at the diary and they said that no, during that day I was like I went to shopping, I was in the car. So then we realized that oh, that's that's not the case of cycling. That's that's the other thing that they they were doing about that. Imagine if we don't have this kind of conversation or bring the data into the the foreground, we wouldn't have known about that. And I'm pretty sure with the um. With the app, you can lock that detail, but I mean, quite smaller screen and quite limited space, and um, it's really hard to do that in undergo. So with the conversation, we can reveal very important um, situation of, of the data that we, we will never imagine of. So after with the story and collating the, um, the variable data and also the participant diary. So we can kind of like come up with the um, reflecting on the story and the data itself. Um, with the co consolidating data, we, we, we sort of like visualize that into the graph, like in the top left, top left and corner there. So we want to find out what is really happening there. And then we use diary and then we use the conversation from the participant during the, the, the post trial just to facilitate that. And then we were able to like um, um, review what is really happening during that day. So after the like cons uh, con uh, solitary, collating, consolidating all the data, 
we have like, okay, some of the data from the variable divide doesn't seem to um, illustrate um, um, other, I mean, participant well-beings. As we all know, it's really complex. It's social, it's biological, and it's um, emotion as well, psychological. So we want to find out, like, to rethinking about the data, what well-being can be captured apart from sensing divide that we ask them to wear, and how well-being can be related to other type of their physiological data. So um, we we have the the participant to co-design what what do they mean by their the well-being. So the research team print out some of the example of the well-being so that they can pick and decide what well-being work best for them. Some of the example might be um, physical activity card that they can put there as part of their like kind of well-beings. There might be a cooking that they cook, they feel like that's part of their well-being as well. Gardening, being with friends, going shopping, there's a kind of well-being for them. So we kind of like have that of, of with us and let them pick and um, let them relate it with the data that they are expecting to have. And then we have a choice for them just to decide what do they mean by well-being apart from printing the card, the card that we provide them. So this really being the urgency to the participant based on the HDI framework. So they are in control on how they mean or what they mean by well-being and how we can measure their well-being in that respect as well. So we find out that the whole session, this session, they are really enjoying so much because with the couple, they can know each other a lot. So like when we pick the card about their uh, going for a shopping, so one of the, I mean, the, uh, the female saying that, oh, that's you that you like shopping. Oh, that's you that you do the gardening. So they kept sharing experiences and sharing the data with each other. So I feel, I mean, we feel that is really quite powerful idea of drive the conversations and reveal some meaningful of the data by themselves. And at the end, we, we, we sort of get an idea of what will be mean, meaning for them and how we can use other kind of data uh, to relate it to that. Uh, we capture co-creation or decipher it with the potential of the data, a new form, a new way of interact with the data. So in the bottom right, we present some sort of very small like representation of the data using a Raspberry Pi and some LCD screen just to, I think, just to print out the, the digit or some of the smiling face and stuff like that. So the reason that you bring this car, uh, the IoT kit, like a bare bone product is to inspire them just just to let them um, see what is the potential form apart from variable, apart from mobile phone, what could be a potential form of data representation for them that they can use in their daily routines. And throughout the discussion, we, we, we find it's quite fascinating in the end because different couple, they have different idea of how they represent the data and they are really enjoying um, doing this session so much. Um, and we are as a researcher team and we really enjoy the sessions. So we try to keep the session as one hour. So no longer than that, otherwise it's gonna run, they, they, they need to do some other things. So we, we try to keep it minimal for that. Um, some of the finding that we have found like the common term or common theme throughout for couples that we have five is the thing that we call the uh, dialogue leading to understanding of the data. So when I was mentioned previously about the cycling things, so this is the conversation between the researcher team and also the participants. Some of the data is seem to be confusing, but it can be like connected to their own understanding of the data. If we merge their diary 
experiences and also variable with the data together. Uh, misclassification, not always a bad thing. It could be a good thing. It could be leading to another direction that we could potentially use um, in the future. I mean, um, that data science card perspective, right? And um, data can reveal what matter for participants. Uh, with their, their, um, we didn't introduce any, I mean, um, technical term for ECG or electrocardiogram that you can use to monitor the heart rates. So we didn't mention to them, but this is the kind of question that they were asking out like, oh, does the watch capture ECG? So I said, yes, the watch capture ECG, and then you can get the heart rate. But we kind of omit that because it's a bit of like a bit of a work to go to the app, uh, you to stay still and touch it and touch that and make sure you don't move. So it's quite complex, <laughs> complex like um like step to doing that. So we just ignore that process. But some other participant is a bit like, oh, you 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 might have an ECG uh, that could potentially useful for them. And the last thing that we see is that not only just a number from, from the variable divide that we use, it could potentially be something that's meaningful for, for their well-being. Their cooking might be meaningful for them, so they feel happy when they cook. Or when they share experience the data with, with us, they feel happy that they, they, they boost up their, their good well-being there. So that's our, like a kind of a theme that we have seen across four uh, four couples, and that could potentially leading us to a new kind of their uh, representation or a new way to interact with the data, focusing on the well-being perspective. Um. Okay, this is like a a bit of a, a wrap up what we have learned so far. So we can kind of know that uh, the, the conversation or the dialogue uh, that we see from the well-being data, even though some of it is quite confusing, but again, the, the participants have their own understanding, own interpretation of the data, and then they are willing to discuss with, the, with us and to share. Um, Miscultification, not a way a bad thing. As I mentioned, it could prevent, uh, potentially uh, lead a new way of new idea of the well-being as well. And also we see that uh, what kind of data matter to them. Uh, not all the data that matters. So some of the data like uh, um, heart rate might be useful, but at the end, so what? So so what is really meaning for that? So like that, if I have like a, a, a moderate heart rate, but I don't feel like happy. So it doesn't really like align uh, that much about that angle. So we need to really think about, okay, uh, what other aspect of their well-being data that could be a complement, and then we can sort of make sense uh, from that. As, as a human being is a very complex scenario, like even one person to another person. But eventually if we gather enough of understanding, we have our own agency of interpreting the data and our own control, we can potentially improve our well-being at the end. And again, data is a way leading to an alternative alternative way of creativities, a new form of data representations. And the other thing that we have found for this study is that technology should be designed to be simple, not an obstacle or challenge. Otherwise, the, the, the user, especially with the, the older adult, they want something very simple. Being one thing at a time, like if you have a phone, you just want to make a phone call, that's pretty much it. If something really complex, they're gonna stop using it after a period of time. So it needs to be designed um, and embedded within their own environments. The thing that they normally see in their daily routines, 
the thing that they can see in the kitchen or in front of the fridge and stuff like that. And if we make that to be embedded in the daily routines, we can run a longer study so that we can see how all the participants uh, live their life, are there any potential benefit and stuff like that. That's why we want to understand and unpack the smaller scale first, just to understand their, their own well-being, what do they mean and how, they do, how do they use it and whether does it make sense for them. Okay, so uh, this is my kind of last like discussion about our study. So we have found that the variable technologies coming to help us a lot in terms of their monitoring and trackings. We can see the, the potential and opportunity to design uh, our data representations, the personal well-being tool for their own needs. So which the HDI team agency, legitimacy, and negotiability, those sorts of things could be potentially useful uh, to, to, to shape the way of how we design and how we develop. So we need to kind of like dig down in that area so that the, the user can use that for, for a longer time for, for their own well-beings. So it's a still a question mark there because it's still moving forward into that directions. But we also like uh, hope that this idea not only benefit older adults, but it can benefit other people as well, like people with intellectual disability, um, um, healthcare provider, doctor, and children. So if they have their own right to design their own well being or their own data representations, I think that would be a good, uh, a good way of keeping them using for a long time. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Sarah. And that's fantastic. Look, um, I've got a lot of questions for you. Um, I'm going to ask one of them. I'd just encourage um, the audience, if you've got um, particular questions or ideas um, to um, follow up with Siren, please um, put them in the Q&A. The thing that I'm reminded of, Siren, um, when I was a teenager, um, these digital watches, digital watches came out. That was pretty exciting. One of the digital watches that came out had a calculator on it. Mm. How, how exciting is that? Very a exciting. digital watch with a calculator on it. The thing is, whilst a watch was great to wear, and you could just look at it, it was a terrible thing to use as a calculator, right? Um, it, it, was, it was tiny, the interface wasn't good. So what struck me about your um, presentation is that you were helping people see their data. You were making it easier for people to look at um, this side of reality that would otherwise be invisible. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you, well, one of the questions is, do you think that the interface that comes with wearable devices like um, Fitbits and things like that, do you think that has an impact on people's engagement with their data? Um, I don't know, it just, it just struck me that like if I was to buy a Fitbit and it came with two really capable researchers who were mm -hmm. nice to talk to, I might mm -hmm. go out and buy a Fitbit. But um, yeah, do you, do you think the, um, that the interfaces that come with these devices, uh, how do you think that helps or gets in the way of people making sense of their data? I think with their smaller interface, we can, it's, it's might be very difficult to sharing that with other people with smaller scale. But I mean, some sort of the, I find out in the study that I print out the, the larger like graph step heart rates 
and then we come together and then we kind of discussing. We ignore the phone. We kind of like, okay, this is the real thing. This is the real deal. So we go into the graph. You see the big graph there. I feel like the interface need to be more kind of like a, uh, I mean, bigger, of course, bigger. And also it need to be easy to get access to. With the watch, you can, okay, this is the watch. Oh, I see that I complete my fitness. Oh, I see that I can do the calculation there. But it's it's small, but it's not that engaging with other people so much. But with the paper, pen that we print it now, we, we share that, we talk, and then this is the team participants come on board and see what is really mystery here and there. So I think the interface needs to be designed to be um, like a, a core, a central, and easy to access, easy to discuss, and easy to show as well. Yeah, I, I liked um, the, I, I hadn't seen the, um, IoT the, kit. The, the IoT kit <laughs> where you are, um, you know, uh, bringing a representation of that yeah. data and making it more accessible. Mm. What What are your th thoughts about um, taking that forward? Is that something that you think would be worth developing further or are you are your interests in another direction? What are you thinking? So we were thinking that's a good kind of like a, an IoT kind of experimentation. So we be, I think we built two things. So one with um, IoT, the display, the clock, the time, the date and time. So the the digit, and the other one is just like um, it's called a micro bit that you can display some sort of um, of data in on the screen. So we show those two to the participant. They, they are quite interested on how we do that. Um, with that, the second one that we show them is that um, I show them like if we clap, it's gonna display some sort of the data to them. And what they are interested in when they first seeing me clapping, they say, wow, that is the thing that you can do for the well being." And the other thing that they can see is that they can they like something that more tangible, yeah, more embedded in their environments, and they can potentially see the benefit there. I think that's a a, a direction that we are moving forward to that direction. So we now know what they mean by uh, uh, by the notion of well being. And now we know the variable uh, have some potential sensor that we can use. Then we want to, to be a bit more buildings on top of it. And potentially we can bring that to them and then later they can just design on their own, mix and map the thing that they really want. So there is a kind of potential direction that we have moving forward at the moment. Siren, um, I have a question about what you consider to be success when we're talking about data mm. and well-being. There's a couple of times where you've mm. mentioned people using these devices more often. Yeah. And I can see that there are some situations where, yeah, that would be counted as a success. Mm. But mm. having done a sleep study mm. and having had some other measurements taken for mm. myself mm. what was incredibly powerful from that data was all of a sudden I understood something mm. about me that was invisible like you know mm. when you're sleeping you can't see if you're sleeping well or sleeping poorly so a sleep study reveals mm. that so it's a bit of a complicated question but what do you think is success when we think about technology and well-being what 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 sounds like success to you i think i think the successful thing i would say it will depend on like when you go to the participant if they are able to explain their own kind of well-being their own understanding of well-being or expectations and then they can like relate it to their own environment or 
to do a bit more like social sharing or connections. I think that is the success because they have their own agency. They know what they were doing. Yeah. And they're kind of like sharing that to, to their peer, to their partner. And I thought it's quite fascinating when we, we do cap the co-creation at the end, what is really well-being for, for them. So they are like couple and they say like, oh, this gardening is you. So I think in that manner, we can see that is this potential like successful technology that could be complement that. So if people are willing to use for a long period of time, I would call that as a, a kind of like a, a good strategy, a good engagement with the technology. But if like the technology is like they stop using for a short period of time, I, I wouldn't say that's a good technology there. One of, one of the things that you mentioned though, that was really powerful and it's about agency. Mm. You, you use the word dialogue, which is different, I think, from this mm. idea of a one-way flow of information, mm, mm. right? So you wear something and then it shows you some measurements and mm. that goes into your head. Mm. But you like, in all of your study, what you seem to be stimulating is dialogue and conversation and discussion. Yep. So I, I, I would think that, you know, if Definitely. you can promote that dialogue, that's actually another really good marker for, for success for you. Mm. So. Yeah, that's right. So, so look, Siren, we're, we're reaching the end of uh, our time together. And I just wanted to um, thank you for showing us a different aspect of data science, but one that's incredibly important for all of us, because mm -hmm. as you say, we're all, <laughs> we're all getting older. Are there any that's particular, right. are there any, do you have any particular wishes when you are as old as the participants in your study, what do you hope that, that technology looks like? Um, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> well, you, you've, got, you've got plenty of time, but. Uh... <laughs> so I hope the technology could help me in some way that yeah. it could like live our life like better, like have my own agency to control things by ourselves. And then also something that we can potentially share with our close friends or family if we are in trouble, just like in critical condition and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, um, Siren, I, I hope we all get a chance to experience the technology uh, that will be beneficial to us as we age. Thank you so much for sharing with us uh, the study. Um, if uh, any of the audience have follow-up questions, I know they can reach you directly. But for the time being, Siren, thank you so much for a thank great presentation so and um, all the best for the next part of the study. Thank you so much, David. And thank you everyone for joining in. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Bye now. Bye.